Hey, if you end up liking the video, you should like the video. Crazy idea. I would love it if you did. Also, if you're looking for a DVD community to play with, I play with viewers all the time on my Twitch. You should come check it out. It's an awesome little community of great people. So let's uh, get into the video. After my DMS perk rundown video, which you should check out if you haven't, because it's actually more relevant now than it was when I posted it, because yet again, Pain, Res, and Grim and Brace got nerfed and DMS didn't. You should go check out that video after this one if you're feeling it. But uh, a couple people in the comments of that video asked for more videos like that. So today we're going to talk about the weird and rather confusing evolution of hex perks. All the way back in 2016 in patch 1.0.0, we were given the first hex, which would be, of course, Noed. In its current state, Noed is still viable. It's just as risky as a Hex always is, but it obviously does have that later added mechanic where it is revealed to survivors in a certain range of it as it was considered way too strong. The problem the community had with it was obviously it rewarded the killer even if they played the game completely wrong. Every wrong decision had a chance of being counteracted by simply one perk. After that, a couple patches later, we were given Thrill of the Hunt, which in its current state slows down the progress of both cleansing and blessing speeds, depending on how many totems are still on the map. Clearly a bit more of a niche hex, and they were obviously going for synergies here instead of just standalone perks such as Noed. And both of these perks over time have had a numerous amount of balance changes. But as time would go on, we would be given more hexes. And not only would we be given more hexes, Behavior would really get their shit together with the designs of Hexes. It would be a huge day for Hexes to be taken more seriously back on December 8th of 2016, still the same year the game came out, and in fact only six months since the game had released. Obviously this chapter gave us Ace Visconti, the Hag, three killer perks, which were all Hexes, three survivor perks, and Backwater Swamp. Fun fact, Backwater was actually Wraith's map, but it wasn't ready in time for release, which caused them to retcon Wraith's original lore, allegedly based on Navajo and folklore, and replaced it with his backstory tied to his job at Auto Haven Records. Which, by the way, if you want to know more about original Wraith and his lore, uh, here's a link to a Mint Skull video that talks about it in great detail. Absolutely fantastic video. But anyways, back to the point. The interesting thing about this chapter is that all three of Hag's perks were hexes, as I said. This was a giant risk, but Behavior clearly was extremely excited to dive deeper with the hex mechanic and see what limits they could push. This gave us a perk that lets you kill people on the spot, a perk that keeps gens permanently regressing, and a perk that causes everyone to lose all aura reading if hit with a basic attack. All of these incredibly strong mechanics served their own purpose, but they were all given the same clear, clean-cut counterplay which was just cleanse the hex. At this point in time, all hexes still had the same counterplay. Just cleanse it. Though I just said all three of these perks serve their own purpose, Third Seal would fall very much into the shadows of the other two perks functions. Insta-killing and perma-regression just struck a chord with more killers than passive blindness if you hit them with your melee. Especially in years to come where defensive hexes would be added to shield other hexes, such as Undying's main use or plaything secondary use, but we'll get to all of that. Another common theme of hexes is that all three of these hexes would also receive a lot of changes. Now, the changes were very different, as Ruin would be nerfed heavily, Devour Hope would be nerfed heavily, but Third Seal would be buffed heavily. Ruin's regression rate would be changed, Devour Hope would lose the ability to have negative 5% gen progress on a single stack of Devour, and Third Seal would actually be buffed to where the auras included maps, but also it counted with a special attack instead of just a melee. Meaning if I'm a Huntress and I hit you from across the map, you are already blind. But again, even if in their changed states, a lot of people still believe they were too strong. I mean, we still have people complaining about Ruin in 2024. I think it is important to remember though, when bringing up complainers, that people will quite literally complain about anything they lose to. And no, this is not specific to one role, okay? Killers, if they lose, will get mad at survivors for running whatever perk they're running. It, it doesn't matter if it's good or not. And and survivors will do the same thing for killers. Survivors will complain, oh, it's four regressions, and then the killer brings a chase build, and then instead they complain, oh, it's a chase build, I hate chase builds. And again, killers do the same thing with survivors. They'll just point at a random perk in their loadout after the game is over and be like, yep, I knew it, they had this perk, that's so toxic. Dude, like if you're complaining about windows of opportunity as a killer, seek help. Anyways, fast forward to July 2017, where we were given the Huntress, as well as her hex, Huntress Lullaby. In its current state, Huntress Lullaby causes survivors to receive a 6% regression penalty when missing skill checks while healing or repairing. And each time a survivor is hooked, the time between the skill check sound warning and the skill check appearing 
become shorter and shorter until five hooks where there is no warning at all. This hex gets made fun of a lot because it's not really the strongest thing in the world, but again, it's just a great synergy for other builds. I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but killers really do have a lot less wiggle room in the perks they can bring if they're playing to win. And don't get all weird and be like, oh, well, they shouldn't be playing to win. It's just a game. You play to win too. If you're a survivor player, you have played to win in the past. You have put on perks to win in the past. Don't act like you've never done that. So fun perks like this can really only synergize with gen perks if they're going to be considered useful. So instead of trying to make fun and unique builds with this perk, you often just see it with overcharge, oppression, and merciless storm, which is just slow down in a different font. You know, it's still the same function. I guess what I'm trying to say here and the point I'm trying to make is this hex is not bad in my opinion. I believe it synergizes with so much more than we give it credit for. It's just we don't happen to see it that often because it's only really synergized with gen perks. I know a lot of people don't view it as a fun perk to verse, but something about Huntress Lullaby Coolrophobia is hilarious to me. When I'm versing a Terra Radius build or an anti-heal build with Huntress Lullaby, I have fun. That's just me, that's just my opinion, but I just think this perk gets made fun of a lot for quote, not really being useful when it really synergizes with a lot. The next hex would kind of lean into a category of hexes that would become a lot more popular as time goes on, which is almost bait hexes. Our first bait hex is Haunted Ground. This is also the only hex to contain the word trapped hex totem in its description. Obviously, we know what this does. There are two trapped hex totems lit at the start of the trial. If either one of them are cleansed, then everyone is exposed for 60 seconds. It's a pretty simple hex and it's very straightforward to understand. So why do I want to harp on this hex so much? This is the first time the counterplay to a hex has been adjusted. This would be the first hex of many added where the counterplay is not the straightforward if it glows, it goes idea. But this is really where things get more interesting as the next hexes that were added served very different purposes than the intentions of hex prior. For example, hex retribution in March 2020 would be the next hex to be added to the game. Little side note, doesn't it feel like Slinger was added in like 2018? I can't believe he was added as late as 2020. Anyways, a hex would come with Death Slinger that is Hex Retribution. Any survivor interacting with any totem at all will suffer from the oblivious status effect for 45 seconds. And if any hex totem is removed, including this one, the auras of all survivors are revealed for 15 seconds. Now what's the one thing I've repeated so far throughout this whole video as we talk about each hex as it's released is the counterplay is very clear just cleanse it. If it glows, it goes. And the first hex to really argue that point is Haunted Ground, obviously. But Retribution really cemented the fact even further that behavior is not going to stick to just that one form of counterplay for all hexes. Like when looking at Retribution, what is the counterplay? Me personally, I'm still cleansing that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just live by a very if it glows, it goes mindset. If I die to a Haunted Ground player or I get revealed from this perk and I don't know where the killer is because I'm oblivious, bummer. I'm still cleansing it. But tangent and personal opinion aside, all I'm trying to make clear here is behavior was really testing what hexes could do outside of just strong perk that's countered by cleansing. And this notion would only be pushed further with the release of Blight. First of all, this would be the first killer with multiple hexes in almost four years. And second of all, one of the hexes added in this chapter would completely redefine the purpose of a hex as a whole. I assume Behavior saw all the weaker hexes being picked specifically just to shield the stronger hexes by having another lit totem in play. So with this chapter that they clearly put their whole back into, they stopped and they said, you know what, what if we just released a hex that's sole purpose? was to cover other hexes. Of course, we were given blood favor. This one is very straightforward. The moment a survivor becomes injured, all pallets within a 32 meter radius cannot be pulled for 15 seconds. Just an opinion here, I absolutely love this perk and I cannot believe that I don't see it more. But obviously, the real discussion here is Undying. Not only does Undying reveal any survivors within four meters of any dull totem, but it also covers whatever hex is cleansed. If you find Ruin and cleanse it, it won't matter if Undying is active. And even if you know this is the Ruin totem, not the Undying totem, the Ruin totem will just jump to the Undying totem as it's cleansed. To put in simple terms, it doesn't matter which totem you cleanse first. It doesn't matter if you found the bait totem and you found the real totem. Undying's purpose was to make sure that that didn't mean anything. So yet again, we're introduced to another hex where the counterplay is not as simple as just cleanse it. 
but I really do need to harp on the fact that that's not the only thing Undying offered. Especially before Haunted Ground, the biggest complaint about Hexes is that they got cleansed immediately. The RNG placement of the totems themselves would leave killers feeling hopeless when their totem was cleansed like 13 seconds into the trial. Obviously, Haunted Ground helped a lot with that as it had the potential to shield other more important totems from being cleansed immediately. It at least lowered the chances that it would happen right at the start of the trial. But then Undying comes along and it guarantees that it won't happen at the start of the trial, unless both totems are cleansed. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, I could not find the right information for this. Was there not a bug that caused Haunted Ground to keep both of the Hex totems if you ran on dying as well, and you could cleanse Haunted Ground twice? <laughs> Because it obviously wasn't intended, as the perk literally says, the remaining trapped hex totem immediately becomes dull. But I vividly remember versing people where I would get two haunted grounds in one game, and they would be running haunted ground on dying. If you do have more info on this and you can give me a quick rundown in the comments, I will happily pin your comment as extra information. Because I really wanted to add that in this video. And then we'll kind of quickly breeze over crowd control. It was a perk that released rather weak, but recently has been buffed and is a lot more viable now. This hex quite literally blocked a vault for a minute after a survivor vaults it. Yes, it has to be a fast vault, but compared to its release day form, which was only a 14 second block, a minute block is an insane buff. And if you've noticed, I've purposefully been using the present day purposes of these hexes instead of their release day purposes, because I want to talk about hexes in the form that the devs intend them to be, which is going to be their present form, not their past form. If they intended for the past form, then the past form would still be in play, you know? So I guess I'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt here to the devs. Why is that important? Because after crowd control is the whole reason I'm making this video. This is where hexes start to have the most insane identity crisis I have ever seen. A mechanic that up to this point has had a few outliers in definition, but overall it's still, if it glows, it goes, or just cleanse it and, uh, you know, face the consequences. But this is where we hit a point where those consequences of cleansing hexes becomes more and more of a problem. And as the popularity of hexes are on the rise again, the introduction of new hexes just don't make sense. So let's continue on the pace we've been going. The next hex is Plaything. There is absolutely no argument from anyone that this is not a fantastic perk. It incentivizes the killer playing for first hooks on all survivors instead of tunneling one out at five gens, as the brand new mechanic introduced in this chapter, Scourge Hook, would also incentivize. But this is not a video about Scourge Hook, so let me stay on track here. For the four of you here that don't know what Plaything does, it was released in September of 2021, and any survivor hooked for the first time has a hex totem lit randomly somewhere on the map that immediately makes you permanently oblivious. You might think, oh, this is similar to Third Seal then, because, you know, that makes you blind. No, this is very different. Each survivor has their own hex totem, and in fact, for the first 90 seconds of them being hooked and that hex totem being lit, only they can cleanse it. Even if another survivor sees it, it will be blocked. And that's what's important here. First of all, it is the first hex to light per survivor instead of one hex, and it also is the first hex to be blocked in any way, shape, or form. I played DBD on and off for years with friends, never really alone, and then 2021 was the year that kind of changed that for me. That whole year's worth of releases pulled me so deep into DBD, and it's 2024 and I still haven't got out, someone please help me. But the reason I bring that up is because I was I was playing DBD a lot at this time and I remember this releasing, and everyone was losing their minds saying like, is this even a hex perk? Like what is this? Because again, yeah the counterplay is cleansing, but then there's three more of them. In the case of Third Seal, if three of you you were blind and one of you wasn't, only one of you has to find that totem and cleanse it and you're all good to go, you know? If three of you are oblivious from plaything, three people have to go find their hexes and cleanse them. Or someone has to wait 90 seconds per totem and cleanse them individually. But it only gets weirder from here. Thinking back to my mindset in 2021, I am baffled that hexes got as weird as they've gotten because I remember plaything releasing and being like, they will never do a whack hex like this again. And again, don't misinterpret my first impressions of plaything as anything else but a first impression. I love that perk so much. When I took Unknown from Ash to Red when I was making that guide video, I realized plaything third seal is such a stomper build for solo queue. It was by far my lowest losses of any killer I've taken from Ash to Red. In the same way, taking Spirit from Ash to Red and running Ultimate Weapon Deadman Switch made me make the Deadman's video, 
running third seal play thing is what made me make this video summarizing and being confused about the evolution of all of the hexes. You don't care about what inspired me to make this video. Let's continue past plaything. After plaything is where things get really fucking weird. Pentamento. Oh god. I find it so funny that these release in succession because saying Penti plaything is like saying Ender Fury or Overbrine Eruption. Like these perks are notorious for synergizing. The first video that ever broke 500 views on this account for me was a video about plaything Penti Plague which is just really fun alliteration, but what I, what am I saying? Pentimento and Plaything could not synergize more than they do. I will die on the hill that the release of Pinhead into the release of Artist was the best killer perk run we've ever had. Name two other killers that released in succession that had such good perks. We went from Deadlock, Gift of Pain, Plaything into Grim Embrace, Pain Res, Pentimento. What the fuck? Anyways, back on track. What does Pentimento do? Well, Pentimento is a hex that allows you to relight other hexes. Pentimento is the first hex that does not have its own totem at all. Not only that, but if a survivor cleanses a dull totem, not a hex, a dull totem, this perk allows you to turn it into a hex. This perk is a hex that has no dedicated totems while also having five functions while also allowing you to relight totems even if they were dull totems. With just one hex relit, all of the survivor's repair speed on the map is decreased by 30%. Two rekindled totems, their healing speed is decreased by 30%. Three, survivor's recovery speed from being downed is decreased by 30%. Four, survivor's exit opening speed is decreased by 30%. And if you get all five, which I have only ever done with plaything Penti third seal, all totems become blocked. Meaning every effect that I just stated can't be cleansed. They cannot be cleansed. This would be the second implementation of hexes being able to be blocked but in this manner, it is so much more aggressive. It, yes, it is very rare, but let me let me let you in on something real quick. Uh, survivor players, plug your ears because you're going to get very upset that I'm saying this. Run plaything pentimento, and instead of just relighting the totem the second you see it cleansed, only light one totem at a time. For example, there are three totems across the map that are currently cleansed. Don't light all three at the same time. Light one. Wait for it to get cleansed again. Light the next. This guarantees two things. One, survivors will have a harder time remembering where they cleansed the totem initially because more time has passed and they don't know which totems I'm relighting in which order. So they have to go around the map to figure out which one I even relit. But this also guarantees across the board that you have consistent 30% repair speed slowdown. And if they cleanse that totem, you just relight a different one. Then they have to go through the cycle again of figuring out which one you relit while also having that 30% slowdown. A lot of people just view Pentimento at face value and go, let me try to get all five hex totems rekindled. That's not gonna happen, because the second they realize it's Pentimento, it's like Devour. They're gonna stop what they're doing and make sure this doesn't get out of control. But Pentimento, unlike Devour, can be played in such a safe manner, like I just mentioned. Run Penti plaything, only rekindle one at a time. There you go, map-wide 30% repair speed slowdown. That's ridiculous. But anyways, advice aside, you can understand how different this hex is from other hexes. It allows all five hexes on the map to be blocked. It allows five different purposes of the hex. It doesn't have its own standalone totem, and it can't actually be cleansed out of the game. The only way to guarantee Pentimento is completely out of play is by cleansing all of the totems twice. Or, and this is where things get weird, not cleansing them at all. You will see a very common counterplay to plaything pentimento for a lot of survivors is just keeping your plaything. If you have comms and you're aware that someone cleansed and it was relit and then they cleanse it again, leave your plaything. Again, I'm not saying one is the right answer. I am simply saying hexes get more complex, which offers for more complex counterplay. We're hitting a point where hexes make you stop and think what's going on instead of just seeing something glowing and cleansing it. It's also incredibly important to mention that at this time, boons were also the most meta they've been and will ever be, and I promise you of that. I've already made a video about boons. I'll link it in the top right corner. Boons were insanely overpowered on release. 
unbelievably overpowered on release to the point where a new common perk was introduced called Shattered Hope, specifically as counterplay to boons, which is absolutely hilarious now because now that boons are in a much more manageable and safe place, that perk is useless. <laughs> like nobody's running that perk and you could be like, oh, but it's a base perk, you know, you could try to get value out of it. Go, go use Noed, man. <laughs> go use Noed. Also, this was the first base killer perk to be added to this game since the year the game released. And before you say, oh, what about Fearmonger and... That does not count. Okay, those are Demogorgon's perks. They just had a little identity crisis where they shifted them into base perks because they did not know what to do with them. That does not count because it was not added to the game as a base perk. Do not play with me, right? So Behavior Emergency implements this base perk because boons are running so rampant. They are in every single trial. And then boons get rebalanced, as they should, by the way. Let me make that clear. Like, what do you want us to do with Shattered Hope now? You're not reworking it. You haven't touched the perks since it was released. What? What, are we supposed to hang it on the fridge or something? But like I said, this game only gets weirder because the next hex to be added would be one of the weirdest, one of the most controversial, and also within one of the most controversial releases. I have a rundown as to what went wrong in this chapter in terms of design. If you'd like to go watch it, I feel like I'm promoing a lot, so you don't have to. But this perk is called Face the Darkness. It was a night perk that was released in November of 2022, and this perk is very strange. There is no totem lit at the start of the trial and you could be like okay well noed's like that yes noed activates an end game it is the same time every single game it is very consistent survivors know when noed could potentially be in play you know this totem only is oh this perk makes me mad i don't even want to fucking this perk lights when a survivor is injured okay i'm killer i injure survivor boom hex lights okay while the hex is active all other survivors outside of your terror radius will scream every 25 seconds revealing their positions and auras for two seconds obviously you run lethal pursuer and that perk becomes even stronger here's what bothers me about this perk and you're welcome to tell me i'm wrong this is my opinion it could very well just be incorrect where did the design team go wrong here? Now, in my best effort to be objective here, let me give some positives before I dump negatives all over this perk. It does synergize really well with stealth killers who at this time and still struggle a lot in this game with the pacing. If you're a ghost face who's traversing a big map with no intel, three gens are gonna pop before you can even engage a chase with someone. This perk does help with that. Now, the downside of this is it also promotes a hit and run play style. But again, we're talking about stealth killers here. Or let's say you're playing Wraith. You uncloak, you hit a survivor, you cloak, you have no terror radius. Now everyone is outside of your terror radius, screaming every 25 seconds and revealing their auras. And this really does help a stealth killer with engaging contact faster, but also keeping your pressure. I will happily say, and I do believe this is fact, and you're welcome to tell me otherwise, I do, I would never in a million years fault a stealth killer for tunneling. Skill issue, skill issue, you're so bad, skill issue. Go play Ghostface on Red Forest against a forest stack. Get back to me, and we'll have that talk. And remember, if you're super angry about a Ghostface tunneling, you should also be angry at survivors for gen rushing. They're both simply forcing the objective for their role unless you have a bias you'd like to talk about. So there is a positive of Face the Darkness, right? Stealth killers can hold pressure and also engage contact faster because of the intel they're given from this perk because they don't have a terror radius. And really strong killers such as Wesker really doesn't benefit from a perk like this, which is good because he doesn't need to be stronger. He's very well balanced and synergizes with plenty of perks on his own. And that's a great decision. Now what's wrong with this perk? I personally believe it is very strange that the hex lights on an injure and doesn't stay lit. Survivors having to put themselves at risk of staying injured specifically to find this totem is it's very strange to me, especially if the killer's running undying with this. Now, maybe in the perma injured meta, which I did make a video about when it was at its highest pick rate, survivors were often incentivized to stay injured to get more value out of their perks to the point where adrenaline would drop out of the top three for the first time since this game's released because people didn't want to get healed in endgame. They wanted to stay injured so they could use Made for This Hope at the same time while also running Dead Hard Resilience. In that time, this perk was actually quite healthy as if you stay injured, you still do have a consequence of constantly revealing your location. But looking at what the fundamentals of a hex totem is, this perk makes no sense. It has no similarities to any other hex in this game. Again, yes, Noed doesn't light until endgame, but that's because Noed is an endgame hex. 
When Endgame starts, survivors know no Ed could be in play. So, sorry, very strange tangent. I knew this was going to be a longer video, but goodness. What I'm trying to say here, I don't even really know what I'm trying to say here. A hex that lights and then unlights on a reset and then relights on the next injure and then unlights on a reset, you know, the clear counterplay obviously is stay injured till you find it, but that is so strong in and of itself. Because when you look at the only other hex in this game that's like that, where it lights at a random event and then unlights, is the following hex after Face the Darkness called Two Can Play, which in its current state is laughably weak. Laughably weak. And that's kind of where I bring in the over-engineering idea. Does Face the Darkness have an elaborate mechanic to push hexes forward in their evolution? Or does Face the Darkness have an elaborate mechanic strictly to be elaborate. To cite Mint School yet again, he has a video where he talks about how some perks are just more confusing, less efficient versions of other perks. Let me make this clear. In the context of hex design, Face the Darkness pisses me off. As a perk, it really doesn't bother me too much. I don't know. I don't see it too much anymore. And the only time it's really frustrating is, of course, and who is shocked by this, Face the Darkness DMS which actually people in my comments after the DMS video was made brought up Face the Darkness DMS. Behavior, if you can hear me, I know you can't, but we can pretend here. DMS is the problem. Stop nerfing perks that synergize with it. Nerf the perk that synergizes with every other perk in the game. Also go watch my DMS video. Another self promo. Goodness. So coming up to the 15th hex and the final hex added to this game in November 2023, we of course have hex two can play. This hex also lights on a random action. This time, when a killer is stunned or blinded by any survivor two times. The second that happens for the first time in the trial, the hex lights. And then from that point forward, survivors who stun or blind you are blinded for 1.5 seconds. I genuinely want to know, without you getting emotional in my comments, what is the... Tell me what's good about this. I've run into it in multiple games. I've tried to use it in multiple games. But on survivor side, I have never, ever once died to two can play. I have run into Ender Fury Hubris two can play more times than I can count. And somehow, some way, I have never gone down to it. If you have to bring four perks to synergize with one action in the game and it's still not granting you your insta down, what's the point? Being blinded for 1.5 seconds doesn't counteract simply holding W off the pallet. And if you're someone like me that absolutely loves champion a light sprint burst fixated vigil, this perk does nothing. That whole build does nothing in the specific context of Champion of Light. Overall, I would love to know if you guys have success stories with Two Can Play because I would love to know if this perk has better builds that I don't know about. But that leaves us to present day as we have now talked about every hex in the game. And that leaves me with the whole point of this video I was trying to make. Are we over engineering hexes? Have we strayed too far from what a hex is, or are we just getting started and hexes are only going to get better from here forward? If we're not bound to one clear counterplay of if it glows, it goes, which we clearly haven't been since 2017, then why is our most recent hex arguably our weakest one and really only works in one build, to my knowledge? I would love to know your complete thoughts down below. I also, I just want to point out when y'all give me a whole novel of information, I love that. Like when it's nine paragraphs, it's a whole video script in and of itself. I love that you guys cared that much. So as always, I'll meet you down in the comments. And I'd like to, I'd like to tell you guys this. I'd like to tell you guys this is pretty exciting. As you know, or maybe you don't, my most viewed videos on this account are pretty clearly music related tier lists. And I had been asked off the success of the other videos to make more music themed tier lists for DVD, but I didn't want to beat the topic into the ground by making tier lists on stuff I really didn't care about. So I waited enough until there were enough chase themes to make a chase theme tier list part two. It's a lot more in depth per theme. It's EQ'd better than that first one. I'm sorry they were so loud for some reason. In my defense, who expected that video to do that well? All right. I am so sorry about the EQ of that one. But yes, my speech is done. That was completely unnecessary. The next video that will be posted on this channel will be Chase Theme Tier List Part 2. Thank you so much for staying for this 30 minute video. I love you guys so much. Thank you for sitting through this whole thing. That's awesome. Your attention span is not cooked by TikTok yet. Good for you. And uh, I'll see you in the next video for Music Producer Reacts to Dead by Daylight Chase Themes Part 2.